There are times when an artist does not know what to do, what to paint, how to paint it, or why to paint. And these are times that can be thought of as artist block. And sometimes to get out of such artist block, it's important to see things in a different perspective. And here's an image of our model, Richard. And I'm going to keep a picture of him to the top left corner of your screen so you can refer to it as the painting develops. And as I usually mention, if you would like to have access to this photo reference, please check out my Facebook photo reference group. And if you would like to know exactly what materials I used in this video, please feel free to scroll down to the description box down below where I have all of the materials typed up for you. Now, since we are talking about a different perspective on creating paintings, uh, let me elaborate that the approach is going to be first drawing as you're used to. Uh, I haven't drawn in charcoal in quite a while, but we're using just a Nitrum charcoal and I'm using a, uh, a chamois to erase. The idea here is to get the basic block in. You know how you've seen in countless videos. Now once I get the block in in check, I'm actually going to spray a little bit of light fixative over the outlines. Only one coat of fixative, however because I don't want to completely seal off the acrylic gesso on this um, cotton canvas that we're using. By the way, this is a cotton canvas that is uh, mounted onto a panel. And remember, the block in just means that I'm simplifying all of the complex forms of the head into just a few simple straight lines and angles. As you're seeing, each feature is pretty much just, I don't know, between four to six straight lines and angles, and that's about it. Um, just moving these shapes around. Now this is edited, so it's going at a much faster rate. Uh, it is still in real time, but I'm not showing too much of the footage where I'm going back and forth and back and forth uh, with the charcoal. So now the lines look darker, don't they? And that's because the uh, the charcoal has been uh, fixed, or however you want to say it. I sprayed fixative onto the uh, the charcoal. Very light, however. I didn't want to completely seal off the uh, acrylic gesso on the cotton canvas. Now let's talk about the whole different perspective thing. So as you're seeing, I'm starting to mix up the color value web right away, just like I would with the uh, Alla Prima technique and this is actually going to be kind of a hybrid of the classical approach and the alla prima approach so let me let, let you in on a little uh, a little bit of what was going on in my mind as i was developing this painting as i mentioned the week before i was going through uh, some artist block which means it was really hard to get myself to paint and to know what to paint um, so for those of you that wanted to see the continuation of that studio painting that I started uh, last week, I still haven't worked on it, but I can continue to do that. But I do tend to lose some, uh, I, I do tend to lose viewership if I repeat the same painting from one week to the other. So what I recommend is you check out my um, Instagram and you'll see the development of pretty much all of my studio paintings. Now to elaborate on the color value web that I'm developing here, uh, as you'll notice I brought back the uh, gray glass palette so you'll be able to see pretty much almost all of the mixtures that are caught on camera. So I went about going between yellow ochre, alizarin permanent, and sap green. So going between the sap green, the alizarin permanent, and the yellow ochre. Now these flesh tones in particular are quite different. They're quite, um, I want to say, because of the lighting. Um, when this photo reference was taken, it was taken at um, uh, the Hood College Portrait Group in Frederick, Maryland, uh, which I attend. It's an open portrait painting group. Uh, my buddy Bill Mapes runs it. Uh, the lighting was kind of different that day because it was a bright and sunny day. The lighting itself was warm. The background is kind of greenish. So the color variations are going to be quite 
interesting to try to replicate. So as you're seeing, we're starting to develop the half tones, starting from the darkest shadow that we painted in there, and bouncing between the sap green and the alizarin permanent helps me get those kind of uh, muted middle tones to uh, to change the hue from warm to greenish to pinkish. So each little section of the flesh tones I'm kind of varying in terms of its relative temperature according to the uh, shape surrounding. And that's kind of a long-winded way of saying the difficulty in uh, this this color scheme is that there are both warm colors and cool colors at the same time. So balancing between the warm and the cool colors at the same time, uh, it really helped to balance between the sap green and the alizarin permanent. And what I purposefully did was try to avoid my burnt umber until I absolutely needed it. Now, talking about different perspectives, so let me tell you what is different in this painting. As I mentioned, I was going through artist block. Uh, I think I'm all right now, but the past few weeks have been kind of difficult for me uh, production-wise. I was just sitting around. I didn't know what to paint. I didn't know how to paint it. I didn't have enough time to do a classical painting and then have it all ready for, um, you know, the next due date for a YouTube video. So I just said, forget about it. I'm just going to put the canvas there, get my paints out, get the charcoal, and just paint. So this is what happened when I just decided to say, just forget it. All of the pressures of trying to produce quality work and all of the pressures of not only being a, a YouTube creator, but being a uh, portrait artist that has a certain, um, you know, certain reputation online, at least. I just said, forget it. And I started just working. So as you're seeing here, we're working top down from the eyes down to the nose, focusing on the main triangle. Now the idea with the main triangle, as I always say, is that it's easier to uh, move, say, the chin than the mouth, and it's easier to move the mouth than, say, the nose, and then ultimately the eyes are the most difficult thing to move. So. I'm keeping that in mind as I'm working, but I have some very relaxing music going on there with my noise-canceling headphones. I'm not even that aware of the camera anymore, and I'm just working. And what I discovered was that spraying the fixative over the charcoal, again, I just randomly had the idea to spray the fixative over the charcoal, and again, not so much fixative that it would... Um, completely seal off the uh, the primer but what I found is that when I applied the paint I didn't notice it maybe I did maybe I didn't notice it at this point in the development of the painting the charcoal did not alter the color of the uh, the paint so it was almost like working on top of uh, dry paint instead of working over the dry media, which was the charcoal. So now as you're seeing me start to develop the forms, also take note that I'm uh, kind of utilizing, I didn't, maybe I did, maybe I didn't notice it at the time, but I was utilizing the white of the uh, canvas underneath. So allowing some of the, um, should I say, some of the, uh, the light to show through and just like I would with an underpainting, was a very advantageous, advantageous, sorry, move to make. So even like the darker half tones that lean towards the the reddish hue, I still let some of the white of the uh, the tone of the canvas itself show through, which helped to illuminate the color. Again, I usually don't work like this whenever I go in Alla Prima. I usually will have a tone on the canvas, but instead. Um, to do something completely different, I ended up, uh, as you're seeing with the brush there, kind of uh, scattering the paint around just like I would if I was glazing over top of an underpainting. 
Now again, to relate to the uh, topic of this demonstration, or should I say the subtopic, because the main topic is always the demonstration itself, but the subtopic, uh, looking at it from a different perspective, I encourage you, if you're struggling with artist block, I've been communicating uh, with uh, one of my viewers via email, and we were talking about you know how to get over insecurities um, you know, in our process, and I was saying, I have been going through so much insecurity. In particular, these past few weeks, I've been very insecure about my artwork. And what really helped me, and I, I told this to him, what really helped me, or is helping me, is to go to more open studios, open figure, open portrait uh, studios, where there's a live model there, uh, you get to work from life, and you get to communicate with other artists. Just to go out and communicate with other artists, because I think what was going on with me was too much working from photo reference and too much staying inside in isolation all the time in the studio. I suspect that's what was going on with me as we communicated through through emails, you know, just traveling to these artist studios to put yourself in a different environment really helps to break out of that uh, feeling, uh, that uh, feeling of the, the artist block that I was talking about before. Now, the perspective change here is that I completely or almost completely let go of the fear of producing a bad picture, uh, the fear of producing a bad painting. This is the first time I did an Ala Prima for you, for you on this channel and uploaded it. Uh, usually I've been hiding my studies, I've been hiding my uh, sketches. I've been hiding them. I haven't even been posting to Instagram as much just because of that fear. And then this time, I let go. I just said, forget about it. I let go. Knowing in the back of my mind, you know, the concept of light and shadow, form, perspective, uh, linear perspective, that is, uh, and just going with it. Uh, as you can see, the uh, color value web is still pretty organized. The, um, the harmony of the colors is still there, but my mindset was completely focused on uh, just applying paint onto that canvas and not not so much worrying about trying to have uh, each step um, you know, f fully, f fully understood or trying to have a checklist in the back of my mind. First I draw, then I underpaint, then I do local color, then I do perceptual color. No, this time I decided to just go in and as you're seeing, just go with it. Relate each shape to each surrounding shape and just move about in this way. Now, it's important to take into account that this is a type of, uh, a, how to say, a mentality change. And it all depends on your own personality, really. Are you someone that's more analytical? Does everything have to be planned out? Uh, do you, you know, when you have weekend free from work or something like that do you have to have a schedule to the hour of what activities you need to do and if that's you then maybe going with that classical approach where you have each step mapped out is the way for you but in general my own perspective is a mix between uh, being highly organized and then being less organized as you're seeing here. So all of that uh, goes into the kind of more ambiguous subject of um, the artist and the artwork and the kind of personality that shows through within an artist's style of working. Now I'm sure you want me to get back into the main subject now, which is the painting demonstration. So, as you're seeing, I'm utilizing the color value web just like I would be if it was a classical painting. So this is, again, a hybrid between, um, you know, the Alla Prima approach, which is painting wet on wet all in one day, which technically this is an Alla Prima, 
but I have now a ground that I'm working on, which is the white of the canvas with the charcoal that has been uh, fixed onto the surface. So see how I'm utilizing the color value web? You see how I move up from one value to another, and I even just slightly change the hue. Now and then, I'll add a little bit more of a reddish color into the lighter tones, just like you saw right there, uh, to make more of a pinkish tone or transition into the uh, kind of bluer hues, but always maintaining the uh, integrity of the value scheme. And the most important thing is value when it comes to uh, trying to determine the, or even just to show the three-dimensionality of the structures that you're working on. Just like that, uh, just like last week's episode where I made that conceptual diagram for you uh, about the planes of the face and how I conceptualize them. So realizing that I've been talking in the same uh, you know, words per minute kind of rate, I'm now going to slow down the rate of my narration. as we put in uh, that little plain change underneath of the lower lip, you'll notice that I'm actually trying to add a little bit of a cooler tone. So that has a little more influence of the sap green into it. I know it seems kind of weird to, you know, in such a few colors, uh, such few color combinations, sorry, the yellow ochre, the alizarin, and the sap green, and of course the uh, the flake white. Just such few colors can produce these tones that we're working. Now, I am using uh, the cadmium red uh, in the more pinkish areas. In general, I don't really use alizarin for... Um, pinkish light colors rather I use it for kind of more uh, darker warm uh, warm colors so there was a little bit of a jump between the previous clip and this clip as uh, I'm now going to transition back into the regular words per minute um, so remember I said I was very focused on the um, painting my camera shut off so um, yeah, this camera shuts off after 30 minutes if I don't keep track of the on and off button. And then it has the nice caveat of losing footage if I go three consecutive 30 minutes at a time. So, oops. <laughs> but in any case, um, the only thing you missed really was the, um, the formulation of the structures for the mandible. You see the little curvature for the ramus of the jaw and now you're seeing how I'm going to start to apply uh, the half tone for the side of the zygomatic bone. Our model Richard has a very well-defined cheekbone and very well-defined uh, mandible, which is a, a very good thing to have, uh, you know, when you're trying to paint planes on a model, in particular a male model uh, with these kind of, um, you know, plane changes a little more uh, geometric and solid in nature so it's it's nice to have these crystal clean and clear uh, planes that we can paint now as you're seeing it's slightly pinker beneath the um, the cheekbone the zygomatic bone so it does have a little bit of the cadmium red now the mandible itself, a little bit below the mandible, does have a touch of the burnt umber. And now you're seeing another little trick. So I used um, the paper towel, the Viva paper towel, to actually uh, spread the color throughout the lightest area. So again, this is like glazing, um, believe it or not, even though it's a la prima. 
I'm still actually using classical techniques, so this is definitely very different to my usual approach. But when I scattered the paint with the paper towel, it created a flesh color uh, that I don't normally achieve if I'm painting directly wet onto wet, or uh, should I say opaque. And there I'm using it again. And this is what I want to encourage onto you, is to just let go. Uh, sometimes uh, we as portrait painters in particular are so, uh, I don't want to say detail-oriented, but we're, we're such perfectionists, I think that's the word, we're such perfectionists that any little thing um, can kind of, you know, set us towards a... Uh, catastrophic chain of events where we kind of feel kind of pity onto ourselves. I don't know if you can relate to, to me. I've been talking with a lot of you through uh, email, so thank you for all of you that have been uh, replying to me on email. I'm a little bit easier to reach on Instagram or on email than the YouTube comments, but in any case, uh, that kind of you know, losing that fear of being such a perfectionist actually helps in some way uh, to achieve likeness of a model. So again, I'm trying to relate the topic here to the development of the painting. So you're seeing each plane on the ear being developed in the same exact way as the planes of the face. But what I'm trying to Im impress onto you is that relating shapes and drawing the best that I can and still being loose with it and uh, kind of carefree in a way can still produce a fairly close likeness to the model without having to over measure too much. And it's about that time again for me to slow down the rate of narration. And really, I guess, slowing down the rate of narration just means a kind of momentary pause. Just so I don't fill up the video with too much of the same kind of words per minute speaking. Excuse my English there. Now part of the strategy um, that I was coming up with kind of on the spot for this painting uh, was to leave the forehead for last. Now looking at this again in hindsight after the painting was all said and done, see how I finally used a little bit of the ultramarine blue? I barely, barely used uh, the two colors on the end. I barely used the ultramarine and I barely used the ivory black. And the reason I avoided those colors, um, in particular in the lighter areas of the flesh, was just because the alizarin and ultramarine blue would have just set off too much of a cold color on the lights. But now, in the half tones for the forehead, as we approach the shadows for the side of the forehead, um, I did notice it to be a little bit cooler uh, cooler near the shadows maybe that had something to do with the reflections coming from the cool background I'm not entirely sure but in any case the forehead i left for last just because it's not as difficult of a structure uh, this is relatively speaking um, the foreheads can be more difficult depending on the situation or the uh, composition of a painting but in any case, for this painting, I didn't see the forehead as uh, too much of a difficult task. So you saw the kind of uh, flow between the eyes, going to the nose, the mouth, the mandible, the cheekbone, 
and then the side of the top of the cheekbone and then they ultimately working our way up to the forehead. Now I'm just putting in a little bit of a darker a darker accent uh, for the side of the forehead. I did kind of mess it up though I made it too cold. Um, I do go over all of these planes again um, after the fact. So after I cover all of the face I do end up kind of working in cycles which by the way for the medium with this painting uh, since this is a completely different approach I used a different medium I used a medium that's a slow dryer relatively slow dryer uh, it's the solvent free fluid it's supposed to be a fast dryer but I find that the solvent free fluid by Gamblin is uh, a relatively slow dryer when you compare it to something like Liquin uh, compare it to Galkid or compare it to the Venetian medium that I was using before. It's probably the slowest drying of all of them. But in any case, um, I used that medium very sparingly, uh, but at this point in the darks I did use uh, a little bit more of the, um, the medium just so I can spread the tone more uniformly, uh, so painting a little bit more transparent in the darks. Uh, than I did in some of the middle tones. I'd say the thickest application of paint is actually in the half tones. Um, the thinnest is probably in the highlights where I glazed a, a little bit by spreading the, uh, the oil paint with the uh, paper towel. And then the second thinnest, I guess, would be the, um, the dark areas for the side of the shadow of the face. And now we're starting to put in the um, the edge for the hairline. So again, this is way different uh, to how I usually compose a portrait. Uh, so I'm actually starting with the hairline right away, just because the edge for the hairline usually gives me a lot of trouble because the edge work is very, very uh, tricky with the hairline. If you make it too sharp, it looks like the um, you know the model might be wearing a wig. If you make it too soft, it may look like uh, the hairline is disappearing. So it's a little bit of a delicate edge. And now you're seeing how I'm starting to fill in a little bit of a lighter tone for the side of the, uh, the head. And now we're putting in the uh, lighter planes right above the middle portion of the clavicles and then we're putting in the side plane from the corner of the neck as it rolls towards the supersternal notch. So again this this video on top of uh, guiding you through the development of this painting also has a lot to do with artist block and a lot of the feelings that we get as artists when you know we're not entirely proud of our work or insecure with our work in particular the past few weeks I mean I will share with you that I had a lot of insecurity I still do uh, with my work I've applied to numerous schools uh, to teach classes or to uh, have workshops and no one's really taking me so that adds a lot of stress to my life as an artist and trying to you know survive as an artist constantly being rejected by competitions and schools and things like that it, it really gets to me and um, again this is just part of you know being an artist learning how to work through the uh, the artist block and some feelings of insecurity and now switching gears back to the main topic so I'm being very cautious with the silhouette uh, the side of the face putting the sharpest edges towards the areas of focus, uh, the cheekbone in particular, uh, making it a little softer near the eye. So I'm quite cautious with the edge work uh, with the side of the face. I don't want to have too many of the same edges. As uh, I've had this kind of conversation with uh, those of you that are on my Patreon, we talk a lot about edges in particular in the in the live chats where you're seeing me paint in the studio see how I covered the rest of the background and by the way the background color is just sap green uh, and white I chose to go with a pure color 
uh, for the background just to add again something kind of different some kind of change to the way things usually go but in any case the silhouette the outside shape of the head I pretty much had to make up because the photograph as you see hopefully you see in the photo reference the uh, the edges are too sharp and too same on the photo reference and we don't really see edges like that uh, at least I don't think we see edges like that when we're observing the model from life so now you're seeing we put in the darker accents for the clothing that the model is wearing and I'm actually going to alter the color for the uh, the shirt that the model's wearing uh, the shirt that he was wearing in the uh, original picture or the shirt that he's wearing in the picture is a little too saturated uh, for my taste so I will kind of uh, bring down the saturation a little bit for the uh, the shirt remember we're not copying the image we are interpreting visual information And the shirt, I'm going to edit as I usually do. I think uh, I think you you know the um, the way I kind of do vignettes for the most part um, with these portraits. The clothing is usually a little bit less finished than the uh, than the face. So I'm going in very quickly here with the darkest darks first, and then I'm just going to fill in. Uh, the light planes for the collar and then the uh, the shirt so you're gonna see a, a jump pretty soon uh, from where I'm just filling in the color and by the way I did use more medium uh, the, uh, the solvent free fluid from Gamblin adding a little bit of yellow ochre and actually some of the sap green uh, into the mix again just to bring down the saturation and you're actually seeing how the medium helps to increase the fluidity of the paint. And now adding in a little bit of a darker accent, just using the alizarin permanent and the burnt umber. So just a few little dark accents for the shirt. I won't be doing too much for that. As you know, I usually leave the uh, clothing as a vignette meaning an area that's a little less finished in the painting to complement the areas that are more finished, such as the face. And near the end, I got lazy, so I used the back end of the brush with some of the burnt umber to put in a dark accent. And then I put in a little bit of titanium white and ultramarine blue for the highlight of the earring. And with that, I hope that this week's episode helps you out. If you would like to see more painting videos such as this one, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you would like to support this channel even more, I have a Patreon account. If you would like to purchase paintings, take classes with me, or just communicate with me through email, I have links in the description box down below. Don't forget about the Facebook photo reference group if you would like to have access to this photo reference. Now it's time for our new patron shout out. I'd like to give a special thank you to Gwendolyn Domingo. Snotra, G. Michael Steele, and Arolio. I hope I can pronounce your names properly. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your names, but thank you. Thank you so much for all of your support. Receiving this many new patrons in one single week 
pretty much brought me to the point of almost having tears in my eyes. It was such a wonderful thing to have this many new patrons in one single week. I look forward to working with you and communicating with all of you on my Patreon account. Again, thank you so much for your support. I wish you the best in all of your artwork, and I'll see you on the next one.